feast of the king into their hearts. Isn't it incredible how these gifts touch the lives of these children? Every year we see tens of thousands of children in their sight. And we couldn't do this without you, so thank you for packing the boxes. Thank you for praying for these children around the world. God bless you and keep packing those boxes.
before we when we sing that song, I just want to introduce it to you in just a little bit. A portion of our time today will be spent looking at God's faithfulness, and, and when we look at the faithfulness of God, there's an example of faithfulness, of His faithfulness given to us in the book of Lamentations, specifically in chapter 3. This is a book that is believed to have been written shortly after the destruction of the temple and the fall of Jerusalem. It is a book of laments, of cries out to God. It is written during a dark time in the history of God's chosen people. And in the midst of all that was wrong with life, from the perspective of the Hebrew people, we find this grand statement of God's faithfulness. From Lamentations chapter 3, beginning in verse 21. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. If people who are experiencing the uh, difficult times that come with being uh, exiled can find God's faithfulness, surely we can experience it as well.
for all that's been given today. May you use it to build your kingdom, we pray. Bless each one who gives, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Won't you please be seated? This morning is uh, out of the book of Genesis 16, 1 through 10. But Sarah and Abram had no children. So Sarah took her maid, an Egyptian girl named Hagar, and gave her to Abram to be his second wife. Since the Lord had given me no children, Sarah said, you may sleep with my servant girl and her children will be mine. And Abram agreed. This took place ten years after Abram had first arrived in the land of Canaan. So he slept with Hagar, and she conceived. And when she realized she was pregnant, she became very proud and arrogant towards her mistress, Sarah. Then Sarah said to Abram, It's all your fault. For now the servant girl of mine despises me, and though I myself gave her the privilege of being your wife. May the Lord judge you for doing this to me. You have my permission to punish the girl as you fit, see fit, Abram replied. So Sarah beat her and when she ran away. The angel of the Lord found her beside a desert spring along the road to Shur. The angel said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? Hagar said, I'm running away from my mistress. The angel said, return to your mistress and act as you should, for I will make you into a great nation. to remember these prayer requests. We're asked to pray for Leonard Miller. He's having some health issues. By extension, we pray for Mary as well. We pray for Tom's cancer recovery. And we pray for those who are in, a, in the midst of a suffering time, a difficult time in the land of Israel where fighting is ongoing. I wonder if there are other needs here that might be represented by my uplifted hand. We believe that God knows those needs. And I want to give you a moment to take those things to him in prayer. And I'll join me in one prayer. Let us pray together. There are things going on in this world right now that we just can't fully understand. We'd like to, but we lack the wisdom. We lack the, the foresight. We, we lack the, the broad scope of what's going on in the world to fully understand it. But Lord, we trust in you. And so for the hardships that certain people are under, the difficulties they may face, Lord, we lift them up before you. We pray you attend to their needs. Just as Heavenly Father, we pray you attend to the needs of those we've mentioned here in these last few moments. Some we've mentioned out loud, and Lord, we certainly pray for your healing touch on Leonard and on Tom. And chances are, Lord, that, that the uplifted hand is a moment ago represented a great many people who need to feel a touch from you because of something that they're going through physically. And Lord God, I pray for them. I know that they are dearly loved children of God and you care about their circumstance. And I believe you can meet their need and pray that you would. And Heavenly Father, we, we are in this place where it's safe, or at least we feel safe, where we sense your presence, 
and perhaps we come without a care in the world. But Lord, we know that tomorrow might bring to different circumstances. It might be tough. It might be difficult. We just don't know. Help us stay near to you so that when the difficulties of life come, Lord, we are prepared. We are ready. Not because of our great wisdom, but because of your presence, your strength, and your mercy. And Heavenly Father, we, we don't take the issues that face our world lightly. We just understand that there's not a lot that we as an individual can do to affect change half a world away. But we can pray. And so, Lord, we lift up all those dangerous situations to you, the people that are trapped there, those that are making decisions, Lord, give them the wisdom that they make wise ones. More than anything, Lord, we want people to experience your presence. We could give you the names of folks that we know who need to experience your presence because they've never called on you. And Lord, we pray you would continue to call home the lost even this day. And Lord, we gather together. And we pray and we lift these things up in your name. And we do so following the model that Jesus taught us to pray so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive us our trespasses. Today, we're going to be looking at the story of Hagar. It's recorded in the book of Genesis. And in the grand scheme of things, Hagar is a relatively minor character. <coughs> However, <coughs> Hagar, her son Ishmael, and the way God interacted with the two of them are events that are still impacting our world today. And so we're going to start with our story back at the beginning. Uh, in Genesis chapter 12, 
Abram and Sarai, whose names have not yet been changed by the Lord God, traveled to Egypt. They are driven by a famine in the land in which they are living, and so they make their way south to Egypt. And apparently by this time, Abram has become a man of some influence, some measure of wealth. Uh, his traveling party perhaps was fairly large. We make that assumption because he met the Pharaoh. And I think that most average, everyday travelers visiting a nation, even back in that day, would not meet the ruler of the nation. And somewhere along the way, there was a, a little dispute about whether Sarai was Abram's wife or his sister. A little confusion surrounding that. And during their time there, Hagar came into their service. And we don't know exactly how that transpired. Perhaps because of the confusion and, and Pharaoh thinking that he could take Sarai to be one of his wives, um, and that, that would have been, of course, insulting. Um, perhaps it was a gift from the Pharaoh. For it says, Scripture says that they acquired both manservants and maidservants in their time in Egypt. Maybe. Hagar's entire family came into the service of Abram and Sarah. Scriptures don't tell us exactly how they came to be, nor does it tell us the age of Hagar when she joined the traveling party of Abram, Sarai, and the rest of the family. But no matter the circumstance, no matter how she came to be a part of that household, Hagar was with Abram and Sarai in the years following the angel's visit and telling them that they would have a son through whom the world would be blessed. And apparently, they felt, or at least Sarai felt, that God's provision to fulfill that promise was slow in coming. So what she did was she formulated a plan, and her plan was to have Hagar serve as a surrogate to bear the child. Here's what troubles me about that plan. No place in Scripture does it say anybody sought the Lord's wisdom, counsel, blessing, it doesn't say anything about any deep prayer before making a rather large leap of faith in how God is going to see his plan fulfilled, which makes me wonder, was God even consulted before putting this plan into motion? And in a way, that sounds like people today, where we try and ask God to bless what we want to do rather than asking God what he wants to do and looking for a way that we can fit in to his plan or even asking him outright how we can fit into his plan does that sound too different from us in the earlier part of the scripture reading we read about how division built up between Sarai and Hagar following Hagar becoming pregnant in many ways, this is just a natural outgrowth of the understanding of that time of the blessing of God among the average everyday people. For a woman, a child was considered a blessing. Therefore, being barren was considered a curse. And we see this play out throughout Scripture. Hannah pouring her heart out to God before the birth of Samuel. Because she felt like she was cursed because she did not have a child. And her husband said, I love you anyway, and it wasn't enough. No, the idea of a child is a blessing, and part of that goes back into the social constructs of the time. Women did not inherit property. A, a, a man upon his death would divide his estate and share it among his sons. His daughters would not inherit any of that because they would have been married off and they would inherit 
uh, or receive the blessing of the inheritance from her husband's family. So if commonly, if a man had three sons, his estate would be divided into four shares. Each son would get one share. The oldest son would get the remaining share and get the responsibility of caring for his mother the rest of the days of her life. To, to further understand that, look at the 12 tribes of Israel. Israel had 12 sons. One of those sons was Levi. And the Levites are not one of the 12 tribes of Israel because they became the workers in the temple and the temple became their inheritance. Joseph is not one of the 12 tribes of Israel, but he was one of the sons. How come he did not receive a share? That's because two of his sons became bearers of the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. In other words, one son for the 12 tribes, one son was set aside because the inheritance was a temple. Among everything else that he had was divided into 12 parts. Everybody got one share. And Joseph got the blessing of two shares. And that's what would have happened in that day and age. Of course, Joseph would have also had the um, responsibility for his mother. But this is how they understood it. So not having a child was really a big deal. Specifically, not having a son was considered a curse by God. And I would guess that Hagar becoming with child, expecting a child, that'd be a, a little bit of an empowering feeling. Consider, she had no standing in the household. She had no privilege there. She could be sent away. Her responsibilities could be changed. She could, she could things could get very bad very quickly, or they could be, get very good very quickly. She had no control over any of it. But if she had a child, and it was a male child, and he was the heir, her social standing in that household would change, even though the baby would be raised as though Sarai was his mother. And for Sarai, having her own servant maybe sort of live out that changing status was probably difficult. And she probably struggled with it a little bit, enough so that there built up some resentment between Hagar and Sarai. And at some point, that strife got to be bad enough that Sarai went to Abram and said, we need to do something. And very wisely, Abram wanted nothing to do with making the decision about what to do about Hagar. He stayed out of it. He said, it's your, you take care of it. And so she treated Hagar poorly. We don't know exactly what that might mean. We just know that scripture says that Hagar was treated poorly. And so Hagar takes off. She goes off alone, without supplies, into a desert. This does not sound to me like much of a plan. But this is what she does. And while she's off in the desert, an angel of the Lord comes to meet with her. He made her a promise of the blessings that awaited her child. Remember, children are a blessing. So when the angel says there will be, his descendants will be too numerous to count, that can be interpreted as the blessings of God that fall on this family will be too numerous to count. And so that's the beginning of our story, but it's not the end of our story. We're going to move ahead in the story to Genesis chapter 21 and begin reading in verse 8. By this time, the names have changed. It's no longer Abram and Sarai, but Abraham and Sarah. And in verse 8, we begin reading the child. This would be Isaac. The child grew and was weaned. And on the day Isaac was weaned, Abram held, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham was mocked. And she said to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. 
The matter distressed Abraham because it concerned his son. But God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also, because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes, then went off and sat down about a bow shot away. For she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying. And the angel of God called to Hagar from whom, from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. The Lord has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. <coughs> Interestingly enough, Hagar was not a part of the promise of Abraham. She was not one of God's chosen people. But yet she received the blessing and care of God. And we're going to look today, with our remaining time, at what that meant to Hagar in the long ago and what that might mean for us in the here and now. Would you bow with me? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, take and open our eyes in these few minutes that we may hear and understand your word. And more than that, Lord, may you help us understand how we can apply it when we walk out of this place today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to know God heard their cries in the southern part of Israel. In the middle of a desert, he heard a lone Egyptian woman and her son crying. Now, to understand what that might have looked like, know this. Isaac was born when Ishmael was about 13 years of age. A child was typically weaned at about three years of age. So while we can't know for sure how old Ishmael is at this point, it's safe to assume he's around the age of 16. And Ishmael does what older brothers do. He made fun of his younger brother. I'm guessing, can't be positive, I'm guessing that wasn't the first time. And we don't know what it was that happened. Maybe it was as simple as Isaac tripped. Ishmael found it funny. Made fun of him a little bit. Maybe he dropped something. Maybe he was startled and ran for his mother. We don't know. We just know that it's some, something happened and Isaac poked fun of him. Maybe something he had done a hundred times before, but this time, Isaac's mother, Sarah, saw it and became enraged. So we got to get rid of that boy and his mother. I don't know if it's possible, but I believe that that is not just possible, but likely, that Ishmael's presence was a constant reminder to Sarah that she jumped the gun on God's plan. God had a plan. He had put it into motion. It was going to happen in his timing, and she came up with something on her own. Maybe you've done that. Maybe you haven't. I will tell you that I have. And maybe that constant reminder that there was a time in her life where she lacked faith in what God was going to do wore on her. And now she had a reason to get rid of the boy. And so she asked Abraham to send him away. And Abraham did just that. But I want you to understand this. And by the way, this is not a, an analysis of Abraham's parenting style or whether or not it's justified, this, this is just what happened. 
In Genesis 25, 6, we are told that he did the same thing with other children. He sent them away. After Sarah died, he had other wives, he had other children, and shortly before his death, we are told that he sent, he gave them gifts and sent them off to the east towards what would be present-day Jordan, or if they went northeast Iraq. He gave them gifts and sent them off. The gifts he gave them probably, not certainly, but probably were items of value. Maybe family heirlooms or the equivalent, whatever you would have as an heirloom back in that day. And off they went. <coughs> but when Ishmael was sent away, he was sent away for a little bit of food and some water. And rather than being sent towards cities in the east, he, they went south through the desert of Beersheba, also known as the Negev Desert, which is near the town of Beersheba. And not surprisingly, they reached a point where the food and the water ran out. Dejected, Hagar went a short distance from where Ishmael was resting so that she didn't have to watch him die. I have, there's nothing in the reading that leads me to believe that, that Hagar has a plan. The, the boy's going to die and then I'm going to try and make my way off. So no, no, no indication that there's any further plan on her part. Which means, basically, she has sat down in the desert and is just waiting for death to come. And in the midst of that, she begins to weep. Understandable, I'm sure. And as she weeps, a messenger from God comes again, like it happened when she ran from Sarai the first time. And he asks, what is the matter? If you remember back in the opening chapters of Genesis, Adam and Eve eat of the tree of knowledge when they're told not to, and they hear God coming and they hide. And so God calls out, where are you? Do you think God already knew where they were? Of course he did. So why ask the question? Because it made Adam and Eve realize we're hiding from our father. So the question wasn't for God's benefit. The question was for the person being asked. It was for their benefit. Same thing here. What's the matter? You think God doesn't know? Why are you crying? God doesn't know why she's crying. Who needs this information? No, but why is she crying? Why precisely is she crying? Is she despondent over what she believes to be the pending death of her child? If she is, we understand. We get that. Was she angry at Sarah or Abraham or Isaac, perhaps? And she was, you know what? We kind of understand that too. Maybe she's just despondent because she's lost in the desert and doesn't know where to go. Maybe it's all of these things and maybe it's a hundred others. But God asks, why are you crying? So that she has to come up with an answer. An answer, by the way, that he doesn't wait for, but that's another portion of our study. So what are you feeling today? I don't know the answer to that. I believe God does. Maybe you're sad. Maybe you're lonely. Maybe you're desperate. Maybe you're lost. Not unlike, not unlike Hagar. In short, what makes you cry out to God? If you heard the cry of this lone Egyptian woman in the desert in southern Israel, he can hear your cry. Rather than simply weeping, she could have devoted herself to prayer, seeking what God would have her do, asking for God's provision. But before we judge her harshly for not having done that, let's remember, we can do the same. If we feel lost or alone or desperate, we could be talking to God and not just sitting and weeping. God heard her cries. But it's not just that he heard her cries. He provided for their needs. The messenger doesn't wait for her to answer, to explain herself and why she's there. He goes on and, and the next thing he says is, do not be afraid. Common refrain coming from angels. I, I would imagine the sight and sound of that would be terrifying. Do not be afraid. 
And then he offers both words of comfort and words of instruction. The words of comfort, God knows your needs. God knows your situation. God knows where you are. And then instruction. Go get the board. I would tell you, God knows your needs. And God has a plan. And he knows, God knows exactly where we are. He didn't show up because of the tears then. He won't show up because of the tears now. He knows where we are. And just as God reached out to them, he can reach out to us. Now, you know, Hagar doesn't have to respond to God, right? He says, I know your needs, go get the boy. She doesn't have to go get the boy. She ought to. But she doesn't have to. We don't have to listen to God either. When he comes and gives us instruction, when he gives us guidance, we can reject it. It's not wise to do so, but we can. We can refuse to follow his way. And if Hagar had ignored what God was telling her to do, she could have just faded from the pages of history. Never to be heard from or seen, thought of again. Nothing makes us listen to God. We can just fade away. People do that from church all the time. They just fade away. Just remember this. If that is your choice, if you choose to ignore what God is trying to get you to do, his leading, his words of instruction, if you choose to ignore that, it's not a reflection on his faithfulness. It's a reflection on your stubbornness. Your unwillingness to follow is not indicative of God's unwillingness to lead. God has a plan. God provided for their needs. They just, maybe they follow it, maybe they don't. And if you were to come to me and say, you know, I've asked God what to do, and he just hasn't answered. My first question to you, to you will probably be this. Are you listening for his direction? Or are you just asking for it and going on about your day? God provided for their needs and God had a plan. The instructions he gave went beyond go get the boy. The angel offered words of, of assurance that he would become a great nation. These are words she had heard before. I wonder, in this interaction, at any point, did, did it go through her mind? This sounds familiar. I don't know. I mean, I realize these two conversations are maybe 15, 16 years apart. Okay. I tend to think that maybe an angel coming and talking to you would be memorable. So I think she might remember it. It's probably unlike any other conversation she had ever had. I wondered if the second time the angel was talking to her and giving her the same message. I wonder if it went through her mind. I've heard this before. And then the angel opened her eyes, and there was a well she could draw water from. Now, one of two things happened. God miraculously made a well. Or, out of all the paths she could have taken through the desert, she happened to take the one path that would lead her when she was at her wit's end to a well. In other words... Either way, this is God's provision. It's a part of his plan. Even as she wandered through the desert, he guided her steps, and she ended up in the right place. Scripture goes on to say that they lived in that region, that Ishmael became a great archer, that he took a wife, eventually at least, from Egypt, and that some of their descendants still live in that region of the world today. And as I'm sure you know, some of the descendants of Isaac live in that region of the world today. And some of those two groups still have an issue with each other. And we see that playing out in real time in our world. You can go home right after we're done here. You can turn on 
a news channel and hear updates on this conflict this morning. And because of what is happening over there, uh, this Wednesday at 6, the sanctuary will be open to pray for the conflict in Israel and those that are caught in the midst of it. I encourage you to be in prayer for those folks anytime. But Wednesday here is one time this week. Note this. God had a plan for Isaac. We know that. God had a plan for Ishmael. And God has a plan for you. No matter how dark the circumstances may seem, no matter how lost you may feel in any given moment, no matter how desperate or alone you think you are, God has a plan. And we should never doubt that. We may not understand it, but we shouldn't doubt its existence. Now, as a church, we are coming out of a time of great concern and at times confusion. And as individuals, we may find ourselves in a time where we have deep concerns and we're confused about what to do next. You may be acquainted with darkness, the darkness that comes from feeling lost, desperate, and alone. That's you. I want you to remember. God hears you. He will provide for you. He has a plan for you. Not just a plan for the world. A plan for you. Would you bow with me? Before we go into prayer, I just want to say if you are having some struggles, maybe figuring out exactly how God's plan for you needs to unfold. I encourage you to spend time with him in prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we lift up folks gathered here, folks that have struggles and need to feel your presence, folks that may not know what their next step should be, but Lord, you do. May you bless them, not just with your presence here in this place, but may you guide their steps and their ways as they lead. For we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. And we will stand together as we sing our last song. And I want to invite you, if you need to spend this time in prayer, you can do so up here at this altar. You can pray in your chairs or in your seats as well. So let us sing together. we are reminded that we are always watching over.
God goes with you. You're not alone. No matter how alone you may feel, you're not lost. Even if you feel lost, there's no reason to be desperate. The creator of the universe hears you. He sees you. He knows what you need. And he walks with you this week. May you find his presence to be sufficient in all things, both now and always. Amen.